94.9 WDKB. It's Sean here in the morning show, and I am joined by Dr. Jock Samis and Michael Carr from Panoptic Solutions. It's the Small Business Development Webinar Series. We've been doing this for a while now with Dr. Jock, and we always have a special guest. It's in conjunction with Wabonsi Community College and also Kishwaukee Community College and the Small Business Development Center as well. So, gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Sean. My pleasure. Thank you. So, Dr. Jock, I'm going to let you start things off and uh, start the questioning with uh, with Mike about uh, what it is that he does. All right. So uh, just to, to let our fans know, every once in a while, we like to ask our guests if they have anything specific that they want to tell us. Now, Mike sent some very interesting questions, and I want to refer to one before we really get started. And the question is, why aren't there unicorns, Mike? Uh, well, really, it's an evolutionary issue. You see, uh, the thing is, the unicorns are the narwhals, and they just haven't come back out of the ocean yet, much like, you know, whales or hippopotamuses were whales, and then they, you know, they came back to being hippopotamuses. So we're just waiting on the narwhal to finish their evolutionary uh, rotation, and, and there will be unicorns. And how do you spell narwhal? N-A-R-W-H-A-L? No, you've missed a big letter there. Sean, do you know how to spell narwhal? I was lost when you said unicorns. So uh. <laughs> It starts with a G because I remember reading, having an alphabet book with my kids and it was a G. So that's today's little lesson. All right. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you next time. <laughs> I'm thank sorry. God, that was your over. line. Was, was yes. it, Sean? I'm sorry. Yes. Thank goodness that's over. Okay. Uh, you know, so Mike, we're talking about innovation and slaying the giants and you seem to have entered into an industry where there's a bunch of big guys. But, you know, why don't you just kind of explain what uh, Panoptic does, how you've done it, and how you've gotten there, if you don't mind. Sure. And when you take, and by the way, when you take a breath, Sean and I are going to jump in and ask you something else to take you off off course. So just so you know. Uh, good news. I've been uh, spearfishing for years, so I can go about four and a half minutes without breathing. You guys are in oh, for a boy. treat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, so uh, Panoptic Solutions was really born out of, uh, it was founded myself and my father. Uh, he was working in the trades as an electrician. I was working at the time for uh, a major building contractor where I was uh, project managing. And, and we both kind of came to this realization that there was a lot of, or it kind of, yeah, there was, well, it's the planned obsolescence, obsolescence issue. There are a lot of things in the modern economy that aren't working the way we need them to to support society and really help average people be successful. And I know that's a kind of vacuous statement. The, the place where we identified it was in mass produced industrial equipment. So we got into this little niche of looking at mass produced electrical equipment for data center operators, looking for inconsistencies that uh, could threaten their overall system architecture. So our, that's probably a good place to start asking questions because I never use small words and people hate it. Okay, so what does that really mean? <laughs> uh, that means that we go into data centers and we check to see the outlets that the internet is plugged into and make sure they don't start on fire so all the computers that run the internet can stay running the internet. You know, we're, so typically who does this now? Uh, there's, there really isn't a place for it in the data center industry so much in terms of construction. There's a lot of build it and have faith in it. The what we're supplying these proactive maintenance insights are kind of uh, just breaking into the awareness of data centers. They're in these huge, especially the big players, they're in these huge pushes to build as many facilities as fast as they can. And they've been operating under the assumption that the equipment they're putting in is resilient and it doesn't have failure issues. And what they're seeing is over life as they're operating these facilities, cost of operations going up, rate of failure is higher than anticipated. Um, so we were lucky. We got in with an early adopter on these proactive solutions, and we're at a point now where we feel the industry is transitioning, and we're seeing a lot more adoption of big players looking to bring on these kinds of proactive solutions. So to answer your question, not very many people are doing it right now. It's right. you know industrial uh, industrial chemistry, industrial manufacturing, and like high throughput, high quality situations, data centers. Um, most people who don't own infrastructure with a value of less than $100 million don't care. Uh, and that's really where we've identified an, a niche and we're trying to grow into 
bringing the kind of services that we have been providing to these big players down to medium and small businesses and municipalities to, to really spread that benefit and try and make it more accessible. So then Sean's company is a target since they're over a hundred million dollars. Right, Sean? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so how many data centers do you have? <laughs> so, you, know, you mentioned, you mentioned Amazon, Mike. So are you doing anything locally with Amazon? Uh, we're not. Okay. And what's, what's the obstacles there? Um, so the, the biggest issue that we see in bringing our service to market is, um, is that user education, is that shifting perspective on the CFO and the COO and the ops management level where a lot of manager or management philosophy is like, we've got what we have, we're gonna deal with it and just plow through. And um, yeah, so our big barrier has been in that education to say, you, you don't, you're setting yourself up for a problem you have to plow through. If you approach this differently, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have to have this whole reactionary apparatus. You could have an apparatus that's driving revenue instead of putting out fires. So, and a, a company like Amazon, somebody tells them that 30 times a day in their email <laughs> of every executive. So it's really been an issue of making those personal connections and, and finding those ends. And that's again, why we've been focusing on the medium and small business uh, trying to develop local footprints and develop the, that confidence. So when those big players are in the marketplace, we can reference back, uh, back to existing successes. So do you have any local, um, success stories, Mike? Yeah. Our that biggest you're allowed to talk about. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's because the problem. It's Mike all was in the army, yeah. so he could kill us, Sean, just like that. So, well, and I was going to, I was going to get to that. I was going to get to your background here after you answer that question from Jock, because I think you have, a very impressive background, which makes you an expert in a lot of these situations. So after you ask uh, or answer Jock's question, we're going to dive into your background a little bit so that we can talk about that you won't yeah. have to hurt either one of us. <laughs> right. Thank you. Well, Sean. yeah, the thing is they come to get me before I have to come to get you. So uh, I, I know not to say anything because because then I got to fight them while I look for you. It's a whole deal. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So do you have any success stories that you can talk about without hurting anyone? Certainly. No, that's actually what we've been focusing on. Uh, and our big success story right now is we've been working with the city of Rochelle for the last year and a half, kind of using them as an incubator. They were you know, really great to us. They allowed us to get involved with them and bring some of those higher end services that we've been developing uh, in the data center industry sector into the municipality sector. And um so with the city of Rochelle, we've helped them. We just ran a project for them where a $5,000 budget that we wrote down as, as part of a, basically we built a coalition with them saying, we're gonna provide you free services so that we can uh, create these stories of value add that will help us market our, our products and services elsewhere. Our company's based out of Rochelle, so it was a natural connection. The city was super helpful. Um, you know, They helped connect us up to Dr. Jock and a bunch of other players. And uh, they've, they've allowed us to demonstrate that our products and services can be translated from those big $100 million per site times 100 sites environments into everyday towns and communities. Uh, so a couple of projects we ran for them, uh, we did a $5,000 assessment of their solar plant. We increased the functionality by 30% and got them uh, somewhere in the order of $30,000 worth of free services from the manufacturer because they had equipment that was out of warranty and we were able to demonstrate that they were manufacturing def uh, defects and install defects that they could take back to the manufacturer and get those fixed for free. Um, that's, that kind of brought us into getting involved with their freshwater and their sewer system. So we've taken over uh, a contract for them where we're inspecting and monitoring all of their freshwater pumping station, their um, sewer plant, and all of their sewage lift stations in an effort to prove that next round of value add in our services and, and prepare, you know, finish preparing ourselves with a package that we can repeat to other municipalities. Now, Mike, so, you all the things you were talking about here, you know, you would have to have one heck of a background in order to claim to be an expert in this. And looking at your bio that that we have, you know, a former Navy submarine nuclear engineer. Sure. What? <laughs> um, <laughs> that you don't yeah. you don't run into one of those every day. 
No, it's a small club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah, and I was actually one of the the elite of the elite. So, like, I'm basically the Navy SEAL of nerds. Um, <laughs> I was uh, specifically on the process control and uh, process engineering side of the plant. So I had to learn everything from why does uranium-238 absorb neutrons differently than uranium-235 all the way through to how does the reduction gear work? Why, when the magnet spins and the turbine, does it make electricity? How much electricity does it make? What rules does it follow? You know, on and on, back and forth, uh, water chemistry. And at the same time, I was working the automation systems that made it all happen, which are all in, oh, well, I, yeah, which are, they're super in depth. And uh, yeah, there's a, yeah just an endless amount of technology that's involved and i was lucky enough to get in on systems that are that weren't digitized so i got to learn about circuits and what circuits do and what that design intent was and that gives me another really unique perspective in these industrial environments because uh, you know when somebody else is thinking of a program i'm thinking of okay you've got an op amp comparator that's being fed by two signals and this is a three wire bridge and it's sending this piece of information here and there's a multiplexer that's converting that signal there uh whereas somebody else is like you know the block diagrams they connect and it does the thing um it's you know mike how you, i would have described it yeah yeah, yeah. mike you you <laughs> lost both of us at nuclear submarine I, I so got, that's uranium did it for me actually <laughs> It but, does I mean, for a lot of people. Matter, Madam Curie, too. <laughs> you, you also have a, a great, you just have one heck of a background, like help deploy in robotic welding solutions for Westinghouse, uh, work for Siemens and building automation schools and labs, helping troubleshoot Tesla. I mean, you've got you've got a pedigree here. So what when you're talking about the things that you're doing and working on, uh, even for the city of Rochelle, this sure. isn't just because you decided to do this one day. It's it's because you can, <laughs> really. Yeah. No, very very much so. And I, at a certain point, I made that decision myself too. Is because I looked at what I had and I was working in all these places, making all these impacts. And I I thought to myself, I have this skill set, and you know, it it can motivate millions and tens of millions of dollars a year for these large organizations, which I'm not necessarily fully ideologically aligned with, or I can take my show on the road. And that, you know, that became the impetus. The military put me in that position. I didn't have a lot of college debt that I had to work off or anything like that. I really, I had a unique uh, skill set, and I had the freedom to, to bring it to market in the way I saw fit. And, and that's really been kind of the thrust of of building my own business. And my business philosophy is, is a applying those skills that I've been lucky enough to acquire in a way that I find most beneficial to society at large and most in line with my, my motivations, morals, you know, whatever you want to say there. All right, Dr. Jack, you're up. I'm still trying to figure out how to spell uranium over here. So I'm my head hurts. Yeah. Mine too. Give it a try. So, uh, Mike, what, what, was that trigger? When did you decide to take that leap of faith? I mean, were you and dad just talking about something and there it was, or you, you thought about it for a while and, and built up a, a war chest before you went out there? I mean, lead, lead us through that journey, if you could. Sure. sure. Yeah, no, it was uh, actually, it was a workman's comp settlement. Uh, the idea had been in place for a little while. I'd been connected with some other engineers and such through my work in the industry. And we'd all been kind of talking about it for a couple of years, somebody really needs to do something about this. There's a market opportunity that isn't being capitalized on. But uh, yeah, I had a, a car accident. I ended up with a, a total of maybe $20,000 in settlement. And I said to myself, you know, this is it. But I, I took the plunge a lot harder than most people. Like there was a lot of tightening the belt. And our first couple of years in business, we didn't have steady a steady customer base or steady revenue throughput. So like, I would not advise people take the path to market that I did, <laughs> you know, it, literally moving back in with the parents and, and splitting a house upstairs, downstairs as a married adult. Like we, we did whatever it took. And um, yeah, I wish I had known more about the kind of things that you could have connected us with earlier. <laughs> it probably would have <laughs> streamlined our two market, but uh, not yeah, as much we, fun. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, we, we saw that opportunity. Uh, Dad was getting ready to retire. I was in a I was in a position where I'd been injured, and uh, we both had similar ideas of we can't, you know, we can't work in blue collar field work for the rest of our lives at, at this rate. So, 
uh, took the plunge together on that. And it's not just you and your dad, because your sister's involved in the business too, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. She's been on board basically since the beginning and she's um, pretty heavily involved. Now she's the operations manager for the company uh, in charge of basically all the day to day and scheduling and it's a huge help. So yeah, see, we're in Sean, a really, I'm sorry. I was going to say, see, Sean, nepotism did work in this case. Doesn't work very often, but it worked in this case. <laughs> It does. And, you know, I'm guessing, Mike, that there's a lot of companies out there. There's a lot of these big tech companies that probably provide some of the same services you do. So would it be safe to say you're kind of the the small fish in a bigger ocean here? And if it's so, what's that like? I mean, what's that like? We already heard about having to live with your parents and start all over again. So we get that part. But just in the business world, being that small fish in the bigger ocean, what's that like? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's really, um, it's, it's interesting. The longer I've been in the industry, the more I realize how much of it's a confidence game and, uh, that, and that really that it's your lack of confidence that's stopping you from feeling adequate in the face of the, those larger competitive organizations. Um, Mike, just one thing. When you said a confidence game, you didn't mean scam. You meant confidence in yourself correct yeah it is a game of your confidence and i'm not saying that in that sense that uh well but it is it's a confidence game on behalf of of all these larger corporations too i mean that's the point of marketing uh is to is to create that expectation in the mind of consumer that the the source of that marketing information is the most trustworthy and whatever so that's where a big company is instilling confidence by marketing through the entire marketplace, creating consumers and competition that all look and say, oh, that's Amazon, that's Google, we could never compete with them, Uh, which in a lot of ways is true. I'm not I'm not going to be out here running a a quantum AI the way Google is in (laughs) by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, if you can come to what you're doing with that same confidence and that same level of ability, even if you're just one person, being that smaller player and being more adaptable, more uh, maneuverable, more accountable to yourself uh, can make you much more successful in in those microclimate environments than those big players can be. Um, You know, if you have those skills and you have that confidence and you know what you're capable of, you can go in, you can issue that competing bid, or you can uh, highlight that difference in value proposition that can win you that contract where uh, your competition, much larger organizations are coming in, assuming a victory. You know, it's it's like the first battle of uh, the Civil War where the Union just thought they were gonna win and you showed up and people were picnicking and stuff like that. Not that I'm here to, you know, this probably wasn't the best time to use that reference, not that I'm supporting the Confederacy or anything, but yeah, but the Confederacy showed up to win and it was not a fun battle for <laughs> the Union. Um, and a lot of times those bigger organizations are functioning with the assumption that if they throw their hat into the ring, it's their game. Um, you, As a smaller player, you always have that uphill battle, but if you're smart, if you're savvy, if, if, you're, if you have those skills and you're confident having those conversations, you can turn around your proposal faster. You can convince your customer more effectively because you can put the time and energy in to get to know them. You can better understand the end customer because you have fewer customers and you have more time to get connected with them. So, um, yeah, it's about that confidence and it's about not letting that, that messaging that in some way being smaller makes you inferior, prevent you from approaching opportunities in the way with the confidence of a large organization. So how much more do you have to prove yourself? I mean, do people take a step back and like, well, that sounds good, Mike, but you know, Come on, I I just can't believe all these things. What do you do then? And it, does that happen? I guess is the better question. Um, more often than not, the conversations we're having now are: I love this and I think it's great. How do I explain this to my CFO? And as we That's a great already, question. Yeah, I've already proven <laughs> I'm bad at that. <laughs> with too many <laughs> words and everything. So that's really our challenge at this point: is converting on those those points of interest and really figuring out how to nail the messaging to that, that large dollar decision maker, because we're, we're on that opposite value proposition. I'm not going to put a, put a check in your hand. I'm going to stop you from writing a check. And it, it, it's a hard, a hard message to put out there. Uh, we are partnering with another organization that helps us uh, create incentives for energy efficiencies uh, gains with those customers. And we're hoping that, 
linking our products and services to a company that uh, gets incentives to our customers for making those energy efficiency gains will give us a, a good in to have that conversation. But we haven't gotten to that point yet in those in those conversations recently. So is there is there anyone in the industry or out of the industry that you try to emulate or develop an idea from in order to to get this thing moving in the right direction? Um, I guess, you know, kind of ideologically, yeah, I don't know that there, you know, we didn't look at an existing company to providing these kinds of services and say, we want to be them, but better. Uh, it was much more that, that sense of, you know, wild, you know, we looked at the digital space and it was, it was a blue sky and we wanted to, you know, we wanted to build what we wanted in that environment. So from a business standpoint, this kind of sound, well, my, uh, my motivation has been historically, if you look at uh, the great innovators in the world, uh, say like a Leonardo da Vinci or a Nikolai Tesla, they've always been, uh, they've always been slaves to the capital requirements of, of existence. You know, they'd never been able to be free. So my motivation was to basically create an organization that can innovate in the way that, that society really thinks is amazing and, and really needs, um, but frees the people doing the innovating from the mechanical necessities of life. So, uh, yeah, most of the people that you would use as a reference in business aren't really in that business. <laughs> so. Right, right. So, you know, I if you had to give the 30 second co commercial so that we as lay people could understand, what would you say? I actually, I got it down to three sentences. My mar I just talked to a marketing guy. He said, gather data, use insights, get paid or save money. You know, that's, that's what it is. Um, I've got a lot of ways to gather data. That's exciting. Uh, and I'm working to find more ways to get people paid. But that's the pitch. Uh, how, I've, I've specialized in finding the data that gets people paid. And more often than not, I can get you paid more than the cost of the services that I provide. So is it sort of like an insurance policy? It, yeah, it kind of is. I mean, it's the, you know, there aren't any guarantees. It's that proactive risk mitigation where an insurance policy says, um, say like an interruption of business insurance policy says, if you have a, an outage, I'll, I'll write you a check. I'm on the other side of if you write me a check, I'll make sure you don't have an outage or I'll reduce the likelihood of your outage by 95%. So traditionally, most businesses looking at that, the way they deal with that risk of outage is with that insurance policy. Uh, I'd be, I'm functioning more in like a specialty services that offsets the need for that uh, insurance policy or drastically reduces the cost. And we're working right. with a couple insurance providers to show them the test case uh, data that we have to prove that we can reduce their payout significantly by having their clients use our services. And we're looking at that as, as an in or as the in, hopefully. That, that hasn't trickled down to premiums yet, has it, reducing premiums? No, no, and that's it's all still in the, the data and the arbitrage and the, the case studies and, and building that confidence on their end that, okay, if we let people pay less premiums for doing this, we're going to recoup more money because we'll be paying out less losses. So I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people don't have this in their budget. Like there's not a line item in their budget every year for somebody like you and your business to come in and help them in essence save and, and cut costs and make more money down the road. So what, how hard of a pitch is that to a business owner to get in there to become part of the line, be, get on their line on it, be part of their bottom line, be part of the budget? Yeah, that, that is the biggest obstacle. Again, like a, as I was referencing earlier, that uh, that operational mentality and especially with the economic downturn and the lumps that manufacturing and industry has been taking over the last 20 and 30 years, that most of who would be our target customers are routinely, they're, they're firefighters at this point. Budgets are shrinking, margins are shrinking, um, and building, even making that connection with managers to get them to think not in a firefighting mentality, but in this proactive, like, yes, the next six months will continue to be horrible, but, 
after that will the the 18 months after that will be less horrible and within three years you should see 10 percent of the issues you're seeing now um yeah how again how we get that across how we change that philosophy is is our number one issue and i've seen it a lot i mean i've seen a couple of places that i've gone into and done consults and said here's where you need to make these changes and i've seen that firefighting mentality and you know, six months later drive by and there's the four lease sign up on the building and you know that you know they just couldn't get out of that perspective of endless firefighting to to make those larger adjustments to the way the organization functions and this going back to it this is kind of where me as a small business i get that advantage over a, a big business because i can take that personal side and i can look at it and i can understand from a psychological perspective where those barriers are and the fact that like i i'm only going to succeed one in 10 times not because i'm failing to impress people not because they don't see value in my product but because they can't connect with it and a larger organization might look at what i'm doing and say cost of sales is too high i'm out um and whereas i can you know with the customer base i've built i can keep my nose to the grindstone and just keep on watching you know watching these losses or I guess not really losses, but failures move by or failures to adopt move by knowing that there are good customers out there, knowing that I'm only going to get one in 10 customers and, and address my business accordingly. Yeah. It sounds like part of your job is creating a culture and changing a mindset. So you're going into a customer base who has a culture already built in a mindset that they're working on. And you're going to have to kind of change that a little bit um, in order to to get your product and your service in front of them to where it makes sense. Yeah. And it, it's a weird space because it's almost like, <laughs> I don't know, it, it's like I have to be the consulting physician for somebody who just had a mild heart attack and be like, okay, it's time to change your diet and exercise. And they, whether they, they want to hear it or they don't want to hear it, that kind of determines what, what the future holds. So. It's funny you talked about hearing it because, you know, a lot of businesses don't hear it um, or even startup businesses, especially don't hear it and just kind of plow ahead without thinking much about it. So, Mike, you know, just getting back to the entrepreneurial journey, what is it that you hate to do in your business? uh Marketing. Uh, that's I'm actually kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of an introvert, so. I, you know, I got a couple hours a day that I can interact with human beings. And that's something that I'm really cultivating that I have to develop in myself. Um, I'm good at, you know, I'm good at process development. Um, I guess personally too, I'm bad at that last 20%. That's, I just, of whatever it is, I gotta, I can get almost anything 80% complete, but I gotta stand on top of myself with a bull whip to get that last 20%. It's the only way it gets done. Wow. Um, I would, yeah. it, did you like operations? Is that why your sister's involved? Because operations wasn't your thing or she takes it to the finish line? Yeah, I'm, uh, again, back to the introvert thing. She helps take it to the finish line. I'm one of those people, like, you'll email me. And if I don't, if I didn't email you back, it's because I 100% agree. And I think you should just do that. And, you know, I <laughs> see that failure in myself. I knew that that had to be, you know, somebody had to be on that human interface side on the business's behalf to make sure the business is functioning properly. So sure. you know, I, I definitely, I'm on that customer outreach side and telling the story and going out and quoting work and helping to support field work and doing training and stuff like that. But um, if it has to get done on time and communicated effectively, then it has to go through somebody else. Right. <laughs> I've learned that about myself. Well, that's good that you've learned that, you know. Was it, uh, Nietzsche says that one of the great struggles of like people who create new ideas is they don't want to share them because once they're shared, like that's it. Like now right. everybody's got the idea. It's not this new fun thing that you have for yourself and it could be absolutely anything. So it's kind of that feeling of like, it's my baby, it's my baby. And <laughs> got to let your baby grow up and grow into something if you're going to see it. Yeah. Um, I, I had a business partner that was actually a thief, took a lot of money from me when I had money. And, uh, he, he would, he would always say your business. And so the way I've rationalized this is I've learned lessons from him. That was my, yeah. I guess that was my second masters, I would say. Um, <laughs> and I rationalized that, okay, every, the lessons he taught me were really pretty cool. And one of the things he said is 
your business is like your child. You know, when it starts off, you're spending a lot of time with it. You're trying to help it grow, make good decisions. And as it's growing up, you hopefully eventually have that hope of hopes that at the end of the day, when they're adults, they're going to take care of you. So that's why it's hard for entrepreneurs to let go because it is their child, like yep. you were saying. Um, but, you know, if it if it gets to where it wants to go, then hopefully um, it's going to take care of you. Now, I know I have no chance with my kids doing that, but <laughs> no, forget about the business. I'm just talking about my kids now. Uh, so I understand that. And Jock, I would probably, you know, I'm, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I would probably suggest that you not be in a business partnership relationship with a thief. I, I'm just going to throw that out there now. You know, you know, Sean, here, here's a tough entrepreneur lesson. And thank you for that. You're but welcome. You get, you get so, so far in that you think you're going to turn the corner anytime. And if we turn the corner, I still would have gotten shafted. Make no mistake about that because of the way this guy was, but you get, you don't know when to stop. And that's my biggest problem. I just didn't know when to stop in business. And I wish that I could teach somebody when to know how to stop. The other thing this guy said, if it starts off bad, it doesn't get any better. And I found that to be very true. So again, I have these gems that I pull out because I need to rationalize this every chance I get. Well, if you could only go back and teach yourself, <laughs> right? how good, how good would you be now? Not, probably not any better, Sean. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would definitely, Jock, I'd, I'd echo that too, though. I mean, those are that the sunk cost fallacy, I think, is one of the biggest oh, issues yeah. that, that small businesses see, whether you're trying to scale or not. But that idea of we have this contract, we have this customer, we have this product, we have this person that we've already invested so much in, whatever it is. Like it, a lot of businesses end up with a sea anchor, you know, something that's just dragging and pulling the whole organization to the side. And you're right. You know, you're taking on water and you can't maneuver the way you need to. Um, yeah. It, but it's like, it, it's your baby. What are you going to go chop off part of your baby? You put right. everything into it. <laughs> right. For sure. um, and I, I would also echo, you know, I've, I've had plenty of issues. I've had, I've had plenty of bad dealings. I've had plenty of people uh, try and screw me. I mean, that's why we ended up uh, living father and son, you know, family and family in the same house. We had a customer that, you know, they had us, they had us, uh, you know, $250,000 in unpaid billings over the barrel because they had paid us $80,000 worth of, and it's, oh, well, we need to be on a payment plan and we don't have enough money and, and blah, 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 blah. And, and we just found ourselves in that place. And that was, you know, a year and a half in and we thought we were going to be building the business around it and having to having to cut that loose oh right Ugh. sean <laughs> can i tell a story a quick story sure thing. are we over time no uh, go ahead. yeah so i my first real job out of college i worked for a wholesale distributor of roofing siding and heating materials so we dealt with a lot of contractors and i eventually became the controller why I have no idea, but it was a family owned business and I was kind of progressing through this family business, although I wasn't family. Any event, uh, we had a collection problem and it's contractors, you know, you get it. And this guy, this was in Philadelphia now, so we got the whole East Coast thing going. This guy comes in and he was a little Italian guy and he talked like this and he said, I'll take care of it. And I'm like, really? He's like, Jacques, don't worry about any of it. I got it. I'm like, OK, great. <laughs> so all of a sudden, this guy starts collecting money like crazy. His name is Tommy. I'm like, Tommy, how did you do this? He says, well, I have a partner. I'm like, yeah, what's this partner? He says, well, they call him the pig. I'm like, okay. He said, and the pig can't fit through a doorway. <laughs> I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, he's that tall and he's that wide that he can't fit through a doorway. But he goes up to people and he says, give me the money. And even if they don't owe him money, they give it to him. So <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those life lessons I always think about. Everybody needs a pig. <laughs> that's not what I took away from that. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, that's not. <laughs> what is it that you took away from that one, Sean? Uh, that I'm scared of Tommy, I think. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> Contract your third-party collection services carefully. <laughs> right. right, exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, gentlemen, I, I appreciate your time today. Mike, do you have something to say there? I think you had uh, some yeah, comments. Yeah, just one more point. I'd say, you know, Jack, 
uh, entrepreneur to entrepreneur who got their ass kicked. Um, to, Is he allowed uh, to say that, Sean? What's he up? is now. Yes. I, okay. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. So and I would um, reiterate another thing from Nietzsche, man, that it's been hard for me, but it's been key to keep going after that stuff. And he said, I, I will allow myself to be deceived so as not to be on guard against deceivers, which is, you know, you know oh, not, wow. to, not to necessarily allow yourself to get taken to the cleaners, but position yourself in a way where you, it's okay if, as you're forming those relationships. It's in a way that it's okay if it's a deception so that you're not looking at those opportunities saying, oh, how am I going to get screwed here? How am I going to angle it? How am I? It leads to an unhealthy approach to business and it leads to a, a poor customer dynamic. Whereas if you're if you're looking at it and saying, OK, maybe this person is trying to take me to the cleaners. But what if what if I am so awesome, so irreplaceable that they they're planning to screw me over and I prove to them that it's a value loss for them to do so. And I keep right. applying it for a decade instead of just sandbagging on your work and being ungrateful and being frustrated about it and trying to play that game defensively, just excel, be the absolute best you can. And if they're not, you learn to be the best you could. Right. It's so ironic that you said taking to the cleaners because it was in the dry cleaning industry. So <laughs> well, uh, you could a, yeah. not have planned that any better. Yeah, naturally, the enforcement, uh, yeah, as, as we do. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> we are going to say goodbye on this episode. Dr. Jock from the Small Business Development Center, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. And Michael Carr from Panoptic Solutions, thank you, Michael, for joining us today as well. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. All right. This is webinar series. It's in conjunction with Wabonsi Community College and Kishwaukee Community College as well. It's our small business development webinar series. And this is 94.9 WDKB.